allows for it. But people have self-transcending experiences, and people have the best day of their life where everything seemed, you know, they seemed at one with nature. Sure. And, for, and for that, it, it, because religion is, seems to be the only game in town in talking about those experiences and dignifying them, everyone, that's one reason why I think it, it seems to be taboo to criticize it, because you're talking about the most important moments in people's lives and trashing them, at least from their view. Well, I don't have to agree with you, Sam, in order to say that you're, it's a very good thing you're saying that sort of thing, because it shows that, as you say, religion is not the only game in town when it comes to being yeah. spiritual. It's like it's a good idea to have somebody from, from the political right uh, who, is an, who is an atheist, because otherwise right. there's a confusion of, of, of values which, yeah. which doesn't help us, and yeah. it's, it's much better to, to have this diversity in, in other areas. But I think I sort of do agree with you, uh, but even if I didn't, I think it was valuable to have that. Right, right. If one could make one change, and only one, mine would be to distinguish the numinous from the supernatural. Yes. Right. Um, you had a marvelous quotation from Francis Collins, the, the genome pioneer, who said, you know, while mountaineering one day, he was just <laughs> overcome by the landscape. Mm -hmm. And then w went down to, on his knees and accepted Jesus Christ, a complete non sequitur. Yeah, it's exactly. never even yeah, been suggested yeah. that Jesus Christ created that landscape. Right. A, a frozen waterfall in three yeah, three, streams, three parts. Yes, which yeah. would yeah. be the yeah. mind yeah. of the Trinity. Well, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're all triune in one way or another. Yeah. We're programmed for that. That's very clear. Um, there the wouldn't, it wouldn't ever have been a four-headed God. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know that from experience. Yeah. But that, that would be an enormous distinction to make, and I think it would clear up a lot of people's confusion, that, this, that, the, that what we have in our emotions, that the surplus value of our personalities, the bits that aren't particularly useful for our evolution, or that we can't prove are, but that do belong to us all the same, don't, don't belong to the supernatural and are not to be conscripted or annexed by any priesthood. Mm. Yes, it's, it's, it's a sad fact that people, in a sense, won't trust their own valuing of their numinous experiences. They think... It isn't really as good as it seems unless it's, unless it's from God, unless it's in some kind of a proof of religion. No, right. it's, it's just as wonderful as it seems. It's just as important. It is the best moment in your life. And it's the moment when you, you forget yourself and become better than you ever thought you could be in some way. And see in, in all humbleness the wonderfulness of, the, of nature. That's, that's it. And that's wonderful. But it doesn't add anything to say, golly, that has to have been given to me by somebody even more wonderful. Well, it's been hijacked, hasn't it? By yeah, the well, it's, also, yes. it's also, I'm afraid, yeah. it's a, I think it's, yeah. a, I think it's a, a, a deformity or a shortcoming in, in the human personality, frankly, because the religion keeps stressing how humble it is and how meek it is and how accepting and um, almost to the point of self-abnegation it is. But actually it makes extraordinarily arrogant claims for these right. moments. It says right. that, I suddenly realized that the universe was all about me. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and yeah. felt terrifically yeah. humble about it. Yeah. Come on. You know, we, have, we can laugh people out of that, I believe. Right. Yeah. Also, and, and, and I think, and I think we must. should. I am so tired of the, uh, uh, if only Professor Dennett had the humility to blah, blah, blah. Yes. Humility, right. humility. <laughs> and this from people of breathtaking arrogance, yeah. I think. Yeah. I, I shove one aside, saying, is it "Just don't, don't mind me. I'm on an errand for God." Yeah, right. <laughs> well, this is a point. Is yeah. that yeah. this is the yeah. point? I think we should return to this notion of the yeah. arrogance of science, oh, because um, yeah. there, there, there is no discourse which enforces humility more rigorously. I mean, scientists, in my experience, are the the first people to say they don't know. I mean, if you get if yeah. you get, if you get a scientist to start talking mm -hmm. off his area of specialization, he immediately starts he or she immediately starts hedging. His bet, saying, you know, I'm not, you know, but I'm sure there's someone in the room who knows more about this than me, and and of course, so, you know, all the data is not in. I mean, it's, it's, this this is the 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 mode of discourse in which we are most candid about the the, the scope of our ignorance. Well, actually, a lot of academics uh, come up with that kind of false modesty, but I do know. Well, what yeah, you mean. It, it, yes, it is. Many is the story yeah. who says, no, I, right. I yield to someone. No, but any but academic yeah. should do that. Any yes, they right. should. But the the yeah. thing about religious people is that they recite the Nicene Creed every week which says precisely what they, they believe. There are three gods, not one. The Virgin Mary, um, Jesus died, went to the what was this, down for three days and then came up again. Yep. In, yes. in precise detail. And yet they have the gall to accuse us of being overconfident yeah. and, yeah. and of, and and, of and, uh, not knowing how, what it is to and, doubt. And 
I don't think many of them ever let themselves contemplate the question, which I think scientists ask themselves all the time, what if I'm wrong? Yeah. What if I'm wrong? I mean, yeah. uh, it's just not part of their repertory. Actually, would you mind if I disagree with you about that? I mean, a, lot of, a lot of the uh, talk that makes religious people hard to, uh, not hard to beat, but hard to argue with, is precisely that they'll say they're in a permanent crisis of faith. There is indeed a prayer, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Graham Greene right. says the great thing about being a Catholic was that it was a challenge to his unbelief. A lot of people live by keeping two sets of books. In fact, yes. it's my impression. Yeah, that's the risk. That in my impression, it's my impression in fact, that a, a majority of the people I know who call themselves believers or people of faith do that all the time. I wouldn't say it was schizophrenia. That would be, that would be rude. Mm. But, but so, they, they're quite aware of the implausibility of what they say. They, they don't act on it when they go to the doctor or when they travel or anything of right, this kind. Right. But in some sense, they couldn't be without it. But they're, they're quite respectful of the idea of doubt. In fact, they make a... They try and build it in when they can. Well, that's interesting then. And so when they are reciting the creed with its, with its total sort of apparent conviction, is this, a, this a kind of mantra which is forcing themselves to overcome doubt by saying, yes, I do believe, I do believe, I do yeah. believe, uh, because sure, really and, I and, don't. And, and, yeah. and, and, and of course, like, the, yeah. others, like the, the secular counterparts, they're glad other people believe it. It's an, aff it's an affirmation they wouldn't yes. want other people yes. not to be making. Well, yeah. also there's this, there's this curious bootstrapping move, which I, I tried to point out in this, in this recent On Faith piece, this, this idea that you start with the premise that belief without evidence is especially noble. I mean, this is the doctrine of, of faith. This is the, you know, the parable of yeah. Doubting Thomas. And so you start with that, and then you add this notion, which has come to me through various debates, that, that the, the fact that people can believe without evidence is itself a subtle form of evidence. I mean, we're kind of wired. To, actually, Francis Collins, you mentioned, mm. brings this up in his book. We're, we're, the fact that we have this intuition of God is itself some subtle form of evidence. And this is kind of kindling phenomenon where if, once you say yeah, yeah. it's good to start without evidence, the fact that you can is a subtle form of evidence, and then the demand for any more evidence is itself a kind of corruption of the intellect or a temptation or something to be guarded against. And you get a kind of perpetual motion machine of self-deception where you can, you can get this thing up and running. But they, they like the idea that it can't be demonstrated. Because be, then there'd be nothing to be faithful about. Right. And That's if the everyone, point of faith. Yeah. If everyone had seen yeah. the resurrection yeah. and we all knew uh, that we, we'd been saved by it, so, well, then we would be living in an unalterable system of belief. And it would have to be policed. Um, right. Well, actually, and it would actually be, those of us who don't believe in it are very glad it's not true because we think it would be horrible. Those who do believe it don't want it to be absolutely proven so there can't be any doubt about it because then there's no, exactly. there's no wrestling Somebody, with the conscience, there are no dark nights of the soul. It was a review of one of, one of our books, I don't remember which, but it was exactly that point. That, that just What a crass uh, expectation on the part of atheists that, that there should be total evidence for this. I mean, this, that they would, there'd be much less magic. You know, if everyone, if everyone was compelled to believe by too much evidence, actually, this is Francis Collins. I'm yes. sorry, this yes. is, this is well, Francis. My, Collins. A friend of mine, Canon Fenton of Oxford, yeah. actually, mm. said that if the if the if the uh, church v validated the Holy Shroud of Turin, he personally would leave <laughs> the ranks because if if they were doing things like that, he didn't want any part of it. Right. Um, the, That's too. I didn't expect when I started off my book tour. Uh, to be as lucky as I was. I mean, Jerry Falwell died in my first week on the road. That was amazing. Yes, that was amazing. <laughs> um, I didn't expect Mother Teresa to come out as an atheist. Yes. Uh, <laughs> sort of, but reading her letters, which I now have, oh. it's, it's rather interesting. She writes, I can't bring myself to believe any of this. She tells all her confessors, all her superiors. I can't hear a voice. I can't feel a presence, even in the Mass, even mm -hmm. in the sacraments. No small thing. And they write back to her saying, that's good. Right. That's great. Uh, You're suffering. It gives you a share in the yeah. crucifixion. It makes you part of Calvary. Yeah. You can't beat uh, an argument like that. Right. The less yeah. you believe it, the more your illustration. The more it, it, you prove it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And the, and the struggle, the, the, the dark night of the soul, is the proof in itself. Yeah. So we just have to realize that these really are non-overlapping magisteria. We can't, we can't hope to argue with a mentality of this kind. But we can, do, we can do just what you're doing now, and that is, we can say, look at this interesting bag of tricks that have evolved. Notice that they are, they're circular, that they're self-sustaining, that they don't have any, that they could be about anything. 
and and then you don't argue with them. You simply point out that these are not these are not uh, valid ways of of thinking about anything, uh, because you 